the fundamental Jewish problem with the Trinity is that it sounds like three gods to Jewish ears. But if we look at the Jewish writers of the New Covenant Scriptures, repeatedly they affirm that there is but one God in heaven. And he sent his son, Yeshua Jesus, as the Messiah to connect humankind to him. Welcome to another episode of A Jew and a Gentile Discuss. I'm your co-host, Ezra Benjamin. And I'm Carly Berna. And we are, respectively, a Jew and a Gentile who both believe in Jesus and believe there's value in looking at history as well as today's world and the headlines you see in the news through both a Jewish and a Christian lens. Now, today we're going to talk about something that maybe at first blush sounds very simple to you, but I promise you, as we'll unpack in the next couple dozen minutes, it's not as simple as you thought, and that is the complex topic of the Trinity. And today we're joined by uh, our co-vice president here at Jewish Voice Ministries, where the three of us serve together, Rabbi Troy Wallace. Troy, thanks for joining us today. So glad to be here with you. Troy, we've invited you on to help us untangle this mess as this Jew and this Gentile discuss. I won't waste any more time in uh, niceties. Let's jump right in because we're going to need all the time we can get. The Trinity. First of all, Carly, let's Give us the answer, maybe most of our Christian audience is thinking. What do we mean? What's meant in the Christian world when we say the Trinity? How do you define that at kind of a very basic level? Yeah. So, you know, you said sometimes the Trinity can can be simple, but really I think it can be very complex and mysterious and something that when I first became a Christian, not something I understood. You know, how can there be three and one? That's like for someone who's very logical, that's not good math. So... If I'm trying to simplify it, the Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's how most Christians would define it. But three unique persons in that. It's it's not one person with three different modes, but three unique persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So kind of like a Costco variety pack of deity, <laughs> like you get three flavors, but it's all... That was terrible. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll probably cut that, but we might leave it. Our audience is either <laughs> chuckling or they're uh, deleting this podcast feed at this time. We hope you chuckled. Anyway, so here's that's a helpful explanation. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Most of our Christian audience is nodding. Yep, that's what I learned. That's the right answer. That's what they taught us in Sunday school. That's what they taught me in seminary. I get it. But here's the thing. Those listening who have a Jewish heritage or who participate uh, to whatever degree in the Jewish community might be listening and saying, wait, 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 wait. I learned, first prayer I ever learned in Judaism is this idea of the Shema, we call it. And it's, it's uh, Shema Israel, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so right away, we're going, wait a minute, Carly the Christian just said three in one, but I always learned one, and one means one. It's not a variety pack. It's a single item. So therein lies an immediate problem, it would seem. So Troy, what is, other than this Jewish prayer, the Shema, what's the fundamental, we can say, Jewish problem with the concept of Trinity? And, and why is that a problem in Judaism? Well, I think that you hit, you hit it right, Ezra, with a, kind of a a simple understanding of the Shema. This idea of Echad or, or one really often lends itself to this idea of a compound unity. But uh, many, many of the Middle Age rabbis used that idea in the Shema to, to make a distinction between a Jewish concept of, of God and a Christian concept of, of God or of deity or of a shared divine experience between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, and I think it's pretty clear from the text, even the Old, Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures text, that there that God, the God of Israel appears in different ways. In Genesis 1, he's a wind or a, a spirit or a breath over the waters. In Exodus 3, he appears as Malach Adonai or the angel of the Lord and, and has a conversation with Moses. Genesis 18, a conversation with Abraham. So really, in some ways, the fundamental Jewish problem with the Trinity is a, is a byproduct of, of the way that it's developed his historically as a distinction or as a marker between two different religions or or ways of approaching God and and I think that you know 
the the doctrine, the Christian doctrine of Trinity is kind of a parable or an idea of how to fit together these different appearances or expressions of God that we see in the text from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, so if we're to have a conversation with a Jewish people, uh, with a Jewish person or the Jewish people, generally, if we don't confirm like the apostolic writers do in the New Covenant scriptures and the New Testament scriptures repeatedly, that we believe in one God. That is, that there is one God alone. Uh, Paul says God the Father. Peter says God the Father. They use that language. Um, and then the Messiah, Jesus, his Son, the Lord, the Messiah. There's some distinction there, and yet the apostolic writers over and over declare a fidelity to the Shema in terms of faith values. Uh, so uh, again, Ezra, to get back to your, kind of the simple answer to your question, the, the Jewish problem generally with the idea of the Trinity is that somehow there are three gods in the midst of it. But I think uh, even uh, the most classical Christian theologians would say, no, 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 no. Christianity believes in one God. It's just a question of these three persons or these three different ways that God expresses himself or the divinity expresses himself. Very different persons. I'm going to lean into the Christian way of saying it. And yet there's only one person in the terms of human among them all, and that is Jesus the Son. Uh, so it, it's a complex issue, and, and I really appreciate, Carly, that you started this uh, by saying, hey, it's hard to make the Trinity simple, yet we start, to, many in the Christian world start teaching their children the Trinity when they're four, five, six years old. So we try to make it as simple as possible, uh, but it's really complex, and many theologians have written meditations on the idea of the Trinity that fill volumes of books. Again, I think the simple answer to your question, Ezra, is the fundamental Jewish problem with the Trinity is that it sounds like three gods to Jewish ears. But if we look at the, the Jewish writers of the New Covenant Scriptures, of the apostolic writings, repeatedly they affirm that there is but one God in heaven. And he sent his son, Yeshua Jesus, as the Messiah uh, to connect humankind to him. Troy, you mentioned Genesis 1, um, and I want to just talk about that for a minute. You said that's uh, that's where it says the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. How would a Jewish person um, explain that, or how would they look at that? Like you said, you know, they see God the Father, God the Father throughout the scriptures, but when they see Spirit of God there, how does that work within their paradigm? Well, I, just let me clarify you said they see God the Father, God the Father. I'm not sure that they see God the Father, God the Father. I think they see the God of Israel, the God of Israel, or yud heh vav -Hey. God the Father is in some ways a Christian concept, although the God of Israel describes himself as a father from time to time. Really the simple answer to your question there, Carly, and I just happen to have uh, the Hebrew text on the screen here at my computer, is, is the idea that ruach, uh, which is uh, the word there in the Hebrew text can mean spirit, it can mean wind, it can mean breath, but that doesn't necessarily translate into maybe the way a Christian would read that same thing in English of the Spirit of God in terms of a person or uh, a unique sharer of divinity. It's just a, a wind of God, the breath of God, a spirit of God. It's a it's a, a personification or a description of an aspect of God without necessarily dealing with a person in the Trinity. Uh, so I, I, does that help answer your question a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, you mentioned before Jesus, what is the one person even though, you know, sometimes we say three people in, in the Trinity. Would you say that if you look back at the Old Testament or, or the history of Israel, that you can see Jesus actually showing up through the history of Israel? Well, what I can say specifically, Carly, just blandly looking at the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures alone, is that there's an experience that many of the forefathers and the, the, the mothers of Israel have with God that is the God of Israel in the form of a man. I think we see that everywhere. 
just from, if I may, from Genesis to Second Chronicles or Genesis to Malachi, we see in the Hebrew scriptures, many of the prophets, heroes, and, and forefathers and foremothers have a, a direct interaction with the God of Israel who's in the form of a person. Uh, and then when we get to the, the New Testament or the, 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 uh, the apostolic writings, the, the New Covenant scriptures, the, the thing that the apostles are saying is that Jesus is the personification of the God of Israel who appeared to the forefathers in the form of a man repeatedly. So that certainly is my own personal conviction, but I, I don't know if we can say that's Jesus um, or that's the son unless we accept the writings of the New Testament. Now, here's the crazy thing. John is the strongest on this point. Uh, John begins his gospel in, in, in kind of a mystical or mysterious way where he's saying, using the phrases in the beginning was the word and the word was God and was with God and through the word, all things that were made were made. And then he goes on to say that that word is the man, Jesus of Nazareth, and, and he came and tabernacled. He dwelt among us. I believe that's John 1 verse 14. And then in verse 18, maybe it's verse 19, but he says this, he says, no man has seen God at any time, but the son who's in the bosom of the father has made him known to us. So when he says no man has seen God at any time, what's implied in John's case, in many of the writers of the New Testament, what they're implying is God the Father when they use that word. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but generally speaking, that's the case. And he's saying no one's seen the Father at any time. No man has seen, no one has seen, no woman has seen the Father at any time, but the Son who's in the bosom or close to the heart of the Father has made him known to us. So the implications of that scripture kind of demonstrate John's apostolic view that the son is the one who appeared with Adam in the cool of the day, with Abraham in Genesis 18 having lunch, with, with Moses at, at the burning bush. It's God in the form of a man, Joshua 5. I mean, just over and over, there's so many. Uh, that's who David interacted with. That's who Samson's parents encountered. It, it's just, it's incredible if we could take John's thoughts into consideration and then look at the Hebrew scriptures through that lens. Really what John's saying is what, uh, is what is the words he puts in the mouth of Jesus in John 8, where he says, before Abraham was, I am. John's having Jesus quote the words of Malach Adonai, the messenger of, the, of Adonai that appeared to Moses. Moses says, hey, hey, who do I say your name? How do I say your name? Who are you? And he says, I am. So John takes that really far. Boy, I could keep going on that, but I don't know if you had any follow-up questions to interrupt. I feel like I have to say, for those Christians that are listening that haven't heard this, this might be like, you know, the exploding head emoji of thinking like Jesus is in some of these stories that you, you know, you're naming all of these things in the Old Testament, where many Christians are like, okay, Old Testament, yeah, that's separate. I'm really going to focus on the New Testament where Jesus is. But this is like, you know, listen to this. This is probably something new that you haven't heard before to look at the Old Testament through this lens. Yeah. And, you know, a friend of mine wrote a book about it called Who Ate Lunch with Abraham. And, and he's kind of the one that builds the case. And he builds the case from the Hebrew text, which is just fascinating and glorious the way that he makes the argument. And, and, and uh, 56 times in the history of the Hebrew scriptures, they're God in the form of a man. Sometimes it's described as malach or messenger, often translated by most uh, English translations as angel. Uh, sometimes it's devar or the word, the word of God appears. That's who appeared to Samuel. The, the, the prophets, um, the writers of the Psalms, they often describe the word of the Lord as, as making activity on behalf of the children of Israel. And again, that's what John is picking up on that language in John 1. And, you know, John's not the only one, though. Paul talks about Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. Uh, Jesus is the one who's made a person or who appears as a person. And, and, and he's demonstrating 
the father everywhere he goes. And again, John says that through his the record of his gospel, uh, specifically John 17, where it depicts Jesus praying to the father. So he's asking the father to come and do these works. And he's saying, you who, who, who knew me from before when the world began, uh, you who glorified me, glorify me again as I was with you in the beginning. I mean, the language is incredible. And, and I'm of the opinion, and there are different scholarly debates on this, that John's having, John's so clear on it in his text because he wrote his gospel after he had the revelation experience. So, so that's an interesting thought. Again, there's always scholarly debates on the timing of writings, but the idea that John is writing something that's wholly unique compared to the synoptic gospel writers, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because he's writing after he had the revelation experience. I mean, John is Jesus's best friend during his earthly ministry. Like they're so close and they hang out uh, together all the time. John's the one that takes care of his mother after he he first dies and then ascends into heaven. Like John takes on the, the firstborn responsibility to care for Mary, the mother of Yeshua. And he's like, He's like, how do I describe this experience if I'm introducing Jesus's life to anyone who would read? You know, how can I begin to uh, to express the the glory of His greatness? I mean, I, I laid on His breast at the Passover meal that we had together before He was crucified, uh, but when I saw Him in the fullness of His glorious nature, I fell down as if dead at His feet. Um, and he goes, oh, I know how I'll describe it. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and with God and the, the agent of creation. I mean, John's understanding of who Jesus is ties him to Isaiah 6. It ties him to Ezekiel 1. It ties him to the burning bush. It ties him to the angel of the Lord's hosts that appears to Joshua. So anyways, I could go on and on, uh, but if you wanted to maybe dig in a little bit more. Some of our audience, Troy, may still be re kind of reeling. You know, they, they assume, and understandably so, if they've grown up in a traditional Sunday school setting under maybe some more traditional mainline teaching, that Jesus kind of comes out of nowhere and shows up in Matthew 1 right? Like he shows up on the scene to inaugurate this new religion called Christianity. And part of what we're doing in this whole podcast, Carly, is saying, no, 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 no. Jesus is the fulfillment of what the Hebrew prophets and the forefathers and Moses and Elijah and those who, who lived and died centuries before saw. They understood there was going to be a Messiah who would be the savior of Israel, but also a light to all the, to all the nations of the earth to declare salvation is available in God to all the families of the earth. But this idea now of, of Jesus actually appearing over and over and over in the Old Testament may be new. And Troy, you're encouraging us through the eyes of faith, like in essence, sympathizing, empathizing with John to say, ah, I see what's happening here. Now I can see it as a believer in Jesus looking backward to the Old Testament. But speak from the other side of it, from a Jewish perspective of somebody who doesn't believe Jesus is the Messiah, whether they're a rabbi or a secular Jew, they have some familiarity with the scriptures, but they're sitting, if you will, in the Old Testament, which, which the Jewish community understands to be the Jewish Bible, because there is no New Testament. And they're not seeing that because they're not looking backwards through the eyes of faith that Jesus is the Messiah. They're seeing this angel of the Lord or the 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 man of God or what have you, the angel of the Lord show up and they're saying, uh, I'm not seeing it. How do you uh, speak, speak to that group? Well, maybe I'll just say it this way. I'll ask some questions. How do we deal with then that the Lord, it says uh, in Genesis 18, the Lord, yud heh vav -Hey, appeared to Abraham in the midst of the, the heat of the day at the trees of Mamre. Like he appears, it, it, and then it says three men approached. So, so the Lord appears, and it seems to imply from the text as one of three men. They have lunch together, and then the three men stand up to leave, and one of them, who the text describes again as yud he vav he stays behind and has a conversation with Abraham about what he 
intends to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And then they have this dialogue where Abraham intercedes. I love to think about who Abraham is interceding for there. Of course, partly he's interceding for his nephew, Lot, but he's also interceding for pagan homosexuals who live in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Like it's incredible who Abraham is willing to contend with God for in terms of seeing them saved from destruction. There's a lot of social commentary there that's implicit. Um, uh, but, but then the text says, and the two angels continued down to the city. So Abraham sees this, the Lord, he recognizes him and bows down to worship him. And then it says he was a man and ate lunch with him. You know, I mean, I think that the historic reading of that in 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 the rabbinic among the rabbinic sages is that they're willing to say that this is some expression of the God of Israel that literally appears to Abraham. But some of the commentators don't want to deal with that. So they say that it was the glory of the Lord or they describe it as the word word of the Lord. They actually are adding language to the text because what the text says is uh, the Lord appeared right there to Abraham. So, so maybe that's just uh, the way to have that conversation, Ezra. Um, and I found those conversations even with my family members who don't believe in Yeshua. Like they're it's a fascinating conversation because it makes the case for what the apostolic writers are assigning as the quality uh, to, to Jesus. You know, I mean, John, again, in, in John eight uses the, this idea to say that, that uh, Jesus says, you know, Abraham saw my day. He saw me and rejoiced. <laughs> and the, the, the leaders in Israel are going, wait a second. Uh, you're not even 50 years old. How, how do you know Abraham? And, and, and Yeshua's response is, before Abraham was, I am. Again, he's quoting what uh, the messenger of the Lord says to Moses, and, and that's something that they pick up stones uh, to stone him about because he's declaring himself the God of Israel. Uh, it's, very, it's, it's just so filled with, uh, with tension uh, because of... There's one Lord, and, and or there's one God, and it's God alone. And we've talked about that on other episodes, Carly, this idea of Jesus being a sage, or Jesus was a good rabbi, and he was a good teacher, maybe a little misinformed, and it's this very politically correct idea. But this, the passage you just quoted, Troy, it, it can't be that way. Jesus either is everything that he says he is, or he deserved to be stoned. And that was, you know, we, I think we, uh, this is especially for our Christian audience, we vilify the Jewish community as we understand them through the Gospels at face value, right? In essence, everything the Jews say is to kind of discount Jesus, and everything Jesus says is good, and his followers are great, and it's this good guy, bad guy thing. But the context there is, apart from the eyes of faith, apart from those blinders being removed to the reality of who he is— he deserved the stoning, except that he didn't because he proved in his resurrection that he is everything he says he was. And that's part of that dialogue with the Jewish community is look again. Don't just leave it at face value. And that's part of what we're doing here on this podcast, Carly, is saying don't let the conversations end three sentences in because everybody's looking through predetermined filters from a Jewish perspective or a Christian perspective and saying we don't have anything in common. We don't need to continue here. Look again. Remove the filters. For the Jewish person, remove the filters that God never actually shows up in a visible, talking, manifest presence in the Old Testament. And for the Christians, remove the idea that there was only the Father in heaven until Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit show up in the New Testament because there's a lot more going on. And if we search the scriptures, we'll see it. Well, you know, in Ezra, something our, our audience may never have thought of is the idea that in the Torah— the people of Israel are commanded that if any anytime anyone shows up and performs a miracle that actually comes to pass and is saying that we should worship someone other than the God of Israel, there's an obligation for the people to keep the commandment to stone that person. 
or, or to kill them, to eradicate them from among the people. And, and if, I mean, I just, I think about how hard it would be for us. Like, like I used to lead a congregation or be part of a leadership team in a congregation outside of Washington, DC. And I, I love to think of the example of if someone came in to our congregation and said that he was God in the form of a man, <laughs> how would our leadership respond? I mean, our leadership respond by saying, hey, uh, excuse me, can you please leave? A and if it came to fisticuffs, we might even be willing to have fisticuffs about that. Uh, so, so we have to put the experience of the leaders of Israel. I mean, John says uh, in John 11, uh, this thing about Caiaphas, and I know most Christian commentaries on Caiaphas is that he was this horrible person who was really just interested in getting rich and he was jealous of Jesus. That's why he hated him. And some of that I think we can find in the text, but everybody who was working in the death of Jesus was corrupt in one way or another, Pilate, I mean, even the disciples to a certain degree. Um, uh, but it says in John 11 that, that Caiaphas says that one man must die to save the people. And, and John's commentary on that is that Caiaphas is not speaking on his own. He's speaking under the anointing of the Holy Spirit to prophesy because he was the high priest that year. I just challenge our listeners to go read that. I think it's John eleven forty two, 42, approximately, verse 42, where that's addressed. And in some ways... John says that Jesus is the lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Like it wasn't a mistake that Jesus was crucified. It was the divine plan to redeem humanity. And the, the people of Israel, we have a priestly purpose. And in some ways we, we uh, agreed to and walked in our priestly purpose to see that the lamb was slain. Now, I'm not saying that the Jewish people, the Jews killed Christ. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that our priestly distinction as determined by Abraham's yes to the Lord, uh, to the God of Israel, was in some ways it required that we do our priestly function to see that God's sacrifice, his atonement once and for all, did in fact come to pass. I mean, among the Gentiles, if I may say it that way, or among the pagans uh, throughout uh, the world before um, a mass identification with Jesus and, and salvation being made known to the nations in him, they worshiped many people gods. Uh, there was nothing controversial about that. So if uh, a guy showed up and said he was Epiphanes or God in the form of a man, the Greeks and the Romans would bow down to him and make him emperor. You, you know, I mean, that's, that's the, the controversy of who Jesus is among the people of Israel is the only way that he could walk into the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood and make atonement once and for all. So the fact that Jesus had to die was in some ways... Uh, the greatest blessing to the nations that the people of Israel could ever give. So, so I think, again, that's a challenge to our readers to think about how they personify uh, the Jewish people as they're reading the, the gospel accounts or the, the accounts of Acts, even Paul's letters. Um, uh, Paul, Paul says that he, he really thought he was uh, serving the Lord. I had a form of godliness, but it was without power. Like he really thought he was doing service to the to the God of Israel until he had the encounter on the road to Damascus. And the God of Israel, it's all in red text, but the God of Israel in the form of a man says, Hey, Paul, why are you kicking against the goats? Who are you, sir? I am Yeshua of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. You know, I mean, it's uh, if we can see that in the sweep of scripture and the reality of even among our Jewish family members that don't believe in Jesus today, they think that they're keeping the, uh, the purity of the faith. Um, 
against the idea of worshiping three gods, for instance, if we close the loop all the way back to the Trinity in some way. So it's, it's about the distinction of the people of Israel among the people of the earth. They were walking in that in the first century. And I think sometimes it's, it's helpful to see the gospel accounts through that lens. Yeah. And I think like you just said, Troy, you know, our, our Jewish family and friends now, that's what we, that's what we want to take this conversation back to. So for those who are listening, are Christians, they, maybe they have a Jewish neighbor or someone in their life and, you know, they're talking to them about the Trinity, but that Jewish neighbor or relative says, well, I only believe in one God. What would you recommend to them uh, at least what knowledge should they have or how should they explain it or respond to their Jewish friend? I, I think that they can uh, they can begin, all of us can begin by saying, you know, the writers of the New Testament, of, of the, the apostolic writings, they, they said the same thing. Uh, John says that there's one God and Father. Uh, Paul says uh, there's one God and Father. Peter says the same language in Acts 2. Um, so I think it's easy for for someone who's talking with a Jewish person to say, hey, you know what? I believe in one God too. Oh, really? I thought you guys believed in three gods. Well, no, we believe in one God, but we believe that Jesus personifies the God of Israel that appears as a man throughout the Hebrew scriptures, throughout the Old Testament. What do you mean? There's God, the God of Israel appears in the form of a man? Yeah, Abraham had lunch with him, and Moses interacted with him at the burning bush, and Moses and he hung out face to face on Mount Sinai when the Torah was given. Uh, so, so it's a, in some ways, Carly, it's like shifting the conversation to the areas where it's easier for us to agree. Um, and I think the appearances of the God of Israel in the form of a man provide a common ground for us to talk about who we believe Jesus to be among the Jewish people. And if, uh, if you're a little bit of a nerd like me, you can get into the Hebrew text and, you know, I mean, Ezekiel 1 says, in the midst of the glories of the heavenly throne room, there's a God in the form of a man. It says Adam. In the text, it's, and there was Adam in the middle of all the seraphim and the, the glorious appearance of the heavenly throne room, and Ezekiel falls down as dead in worship of him. Uh, Isaiah 6 is another one that, that's along those lines. So I think it would be easier, easy for a listener who's interacting with a Jewish friend who, who's saying, you know, well, you guys believe in three gods, don't you? No, we believe in one God. It's clearly in the, if they want to use this language in the Christian Bible or in the New Testament, that we believe in one God. Uh, we just believe that Jesus personifies the God of Israel that appeared as a man. Uh, throughout the the record of the Hebrew scriptures. So that's kind of a different angle and that avoids some of the theological pitfalls because again, uh, the Trinity as a concept, man, it, it's super strong concept or a way of describing the nature of God, but the Trinity itself is not in the text. It's just a way that Christian theologians over the years have developed to explain to put all the puzzle pieces together. And I think it's a, I think it's a solid theological concept, but it's not always easy to defend or explain in a casual every day, if I can say it this way, it, amongst the laity, amongst laymen, those of us who are not always uh, incredibly deeply studied, it's a very complex topic to, to have to tackle. Sure. But what you said, Troy, resonates. It resonates with me. I hope it's resonating with you listening today, whether you come from a Christian background, a Jewish background, you're a Christian whose parents and grandparents have a Jewish heritage, wherever you're at uh, in those worlds or some combination thereof. Uh, we're not going to agree on everything. We don't have to, but you can start the conversation by finding the common ground. So, Troy, thank you for pointing us to some of that common ground. I hope that was helpful for you listening. Part of our objective, as we say so often, is to equip you as a listener to engage. If you have a Jewish background, to engage with somebody with a Christian background. You come from a Christian background, to engage with a Jewish friend or extended family member and not let the common things that you think you disagree on stop the conversation. Push through, get to the common ground, uh, go deeper than you've been before. Maybe you find out you're wrong. Uh, or maybe you confirm that you're right, but either way, you'll have had a meaningful dialogue and hopefully understand the person to your left or your right a little better. 
Well, we hope you found this interesting. I certainly did. And if you like what you're hearing and you'd like to keep that content coming out, we have a way for you to do that. Not only that, but also to stand in solidarity with some very isolated and in some cases persecuted Jewish communities uh, that we through Jewish Voice Ministries and other like-minded partners have the privilege of serving in the name of Jesus around the world. The way to do that is to text us, text JG at 474747. Just for doing that, you'll be entered in a monthly coffee giveaway for some delicious, delicious Ethiopian coffee. I just finished my pot and I'm about to make another one of that Ethiopian coffee uh, right as soon as we're done recording this episode. Uh, Carly's smiling here because she knows it's true. And another way to get involved to find the same information and get more of the details on getting some of that coffee and, and engaging with us here at A Jew and a Gentile Discuss is to go to our website a Jew and a Gentile discuss.org. All the details about partnering financially and about getting some Ethiopian coffee from our uh, very own Lost Tribes Coffee Company are right there on the website. Again, a Jew and a Gentile discuss.org. Well, Rabbi Troy Wallace, thanks so much for joining us today. This has been really helpful. I know I've been challenged. I hope our audience has been challenged, but thank you for diving in with confidence to a very complex topic for the benefit of our listeners. Well, thanks for having me, Ezra and Carly, both. And I just want to say I love the fact that the point of this podcast is to discuss things rather than to to, to, to decide things, because sometimes these theological boundaries between Jews and Christians uh, are better handled with a discussion than a decision. So I just want to say thank you so much for having me today. If you want to hear more episodes of this podcast, you can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love if you leave us a review, share this podcast with someone you know who you think would be interested in the content. You can engage with us and follow us on social media at the handle A Jew and a Gentile Discuss. On our website, you can submit any questions you have or topics that you want us to discuss. Thanks again for listening and join us next week for another episode. The show is a production of Jewish Voice Ministries International.